We are going to turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 1, starting at verse 9. It's good to be in church once again, and uh, thankful that y'all showed up. And uh, if we could stand for the reading of the word, we're going to start 1 Samuel, chapter 1, and verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass that as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, when she, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And he, Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count thou not thine high handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition, which thou hast asked of him. And then skipping down to verse 26. It says, And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. If you could all raise your voices and pray with me before we get into the word. Jesus, Lord, we need you in this place. We need your spirit, the liberty that has been here in worship. God, I pray that it would continue to be here as we try to get something out of your word that would help us, Lord Jesus. Be here in this place. Remove any distractions, Lord, and help us, oh God, just to, just to receive what you want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. And you all may be seated. So for a few minutes this, mor this morning, I want to speak on the cry of just desperation. And how many of you have ever been in the grocery store or any kind of store and heard a child screaming at the top of their lungs, uh, I want it, I want it, whatever it might be, chocolate bar, candy, some little toy car, whatever it might be, and, and they're screaming because they, they want this item. It's a picture we're all familiar about, you know, some special treat they've grabbed along the way to the checkout, and they will not let go, and they're hanging on with all of their might, and Maybe they're kicking and screaming and their face has gotten red because they do not want to let go of this object. And uh, I had one the other day and the crocodile tears just flowing. It was, it was talent. She must be going to be an actress. <laughs> um, and the whole store quickly learned that little Susie or whatever her name was was not allowed to wear her new shoes right away. And uh, all the cashiers figured that out very quickly, all the customers. And, of course, the mother trying to make them be quiet and get them out of there in a hurry because they're causing a scene. And everyone else just kind of smiles sympathetically because they've probably been there before and it's nothing new to them. But by looking at that child, you'd think that their life was in danger, that if something didn't happen, they were going to die right there on the spot. The world was ending. And uh, they, they refuse to be distracted. You can try to distract them with something else, but no, they, they know what they want and they're not going to be satisfied until they get it. And that is a true cry of desperation. Now, I'm not suggesting that you act like that <laughs> or let your kids act like that either. But there's a few things that we can learn from their behavior. The persistence and single-mindedness are something that we see even in the story we're reading this morning, of something that refuses to be distracted uh, when they're going after something. And Hannah was like this in the story. Not like a child throwing a tantrum, of course, but she knew what she wanted from God, and she was going to pursue that, no matter the cost. So Hannah's story. Hannah was uh, married to a man named El Elkanah, but Elkanah had two wives, and he loved Hannah the most. But the other wife had something that Hannah didn't. She had children, and Hannah was barren. And as a little girl, she had probably dreamed of growing up and getting married and having a whole family, raising them, sending them off to school, and watching them grow up. 
And she waited anxiously for that day to come. She got married and she waited years, hoping one day she would hold a child in her arms, and that day never came. And then this other wife comes into the household and she has children, and Hannah still doesn't. She probably had the nursery all decorated and had sewn all these baby clothes, just hoping one day. And instead, the children of the other woman are the ones that are living in that nursery, and they're the ones that are wearing those clothes. And to make it worse, the other woman taunts her and makes fun of her because she doesn't have any children. You know, they're getting, she's getting her children ready in the morning, and she says, oh, Hannah, aren't you going to go wake your children up? Oh, wait, you don't have any. Every, every single day she would go through this, a reminder, a constant reminder of what she didn't have in her life. And that was the desire of her heart. And for years she went through this. And every single year they would make a journey to the temple where they would worship and they would offer sacrifices to God. And every single year Hannah would go and she didn't have any children. She wouldn't eat and she would go into the temple and she would pray for a child. She would pour out her heart to God and weep before the Lord. So the place where we're reading is one of these places where she's in the temple yet another year, and she's praying. And her husband didn't really understand. He said, you know, why are you weeping? Why won't you eat? Am I not better to you than ten sons? But God understood her, what she, her desire, and year after year she would go to God and she would pour out her heart and she would cry to God. Maybe she could have given up. She could have said, it's been so many years, and God hasn't heard me. God must not hear me. He must not hear my prayer. Why do I ha- keep, why am I, what am I holding on to? What faith do I have? What can I hold on to? But the next year, she didn't give up. She still went to the temple, and she still prayed for God to give her a son. Maybe she wasn't so spiritual. She might have not been full of faith. It says she was out of the bitterness of her soul. She had a heavy heart, but yet she still went to God, and she still poured it out. And she made a vow to God that if he gave her a son, she would give him back into his service. And so she continued praying. She spent some time there in the presence of God, just pouring her heart out to God. She's crying, you know, God, I want a son. This is what I want. And the high priest sees her praying. She's not making a sound. She's there, and her lips are moving, but there's no sound coming out. Just silently speaking. Maybe there's tears running down her face. Maybe she's kind of uh, rocking back and forth in, in grief. And crying out in her heart, God, I'll give him to you, just give me a son. And the, the high priest, Eli, steps forward to speak to her, and kind of watching her, and still, she's still quiet, silently wailing in her heart, God, I want a son, it's the desire of my heart, please grant this one thing. So finally, Eli decides to do something about the situation, and he's, he rebukes her for being drunk. That's what he thinks. And she turns to him, and she says, no, I'm I'm not drunk. I, I'm just pouring out my soul to God. I'm just, I'm just telling God what's on my heart and what I'm, my desire is. And Eli says, you know, go, go home. God's, God's heard you. God's going gonna to answer. And the next time Eli sees that woman, I don't know how many years later, but she was leading a little child by the hand, a little boy, and she introduces him to the high priest. This is Eli. This is the temple, and this is new, your new home. She brings him back to God. And from Hannah's prayer, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn about prayer and about when you have a need. First thing is she was willing to uphold her end of the bargain. If you want get, to come get a miracle from God and then come back, go back to living the exact same way, it isn't going to happen. You know, God's a God of mercy, but at the same time, he takes, his va- he takes vows very, very seriously. And if you come and you make a bargain with God saying, if you heal this, I'll live for you. If you heal this, I'll do this. Or if you, if you don't uphold your end of the bargain, that's not, that's not the way it works. Hannah said, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. I'll dedicate all of my blessing. I'll give it right back. And when it happened, she was willing to go through with it. And she brought her child, the one thing she had wanted in life, brought him back to God and said, I dedicate him to your service. The other thing that she did is she continued in prayer. She was willing to spend time in God's presence in order to see her need met. Not just, you know, hi God, I need something. Actually, I want a son. Could you please give it to him? Give it give him to me. Okay, thanks. Bye. It wasn't that kind of prayer. It was pouring out her heart to God, spending time and taking the time to have a conversation and a relationship. Not just coming with a need and leaving, but pouring out her heart to God. 
And that's not something you can do quick. If you've ever poured out your heart to someone, it's not a couple seconds. It it's, takes time. The other thing I noticed is that she didn't care what others around her thought. You know, if they didn't think, she didn't care if they, th if they thought she was crazy or unspiritual. She knew where her help came from, that it came from God. So that's where she was going for, her need, for the answer to her need. She was shut in with God. You know, I don't know if she was aware that Eli was there or not. Maybe she did know that. Maybe he was kind of hiding in the background. But it didn't really matter to her because it was just her and God at that moment. And the last thing I see is that she was persistent. Year after year, she went to the temple. She didn't see her. She didn't see any sign that her prayer was being answered. And still, she went back, asking one more time. And there's a there's a pioneer preacher who taught in a Bible school on prayer, and they transcribed the tapes of it. And uh, we have a book at home, the Verbal Bean. And he talked. He teaches about prayer. And one thing that he teaches in the book is about what he describes as memorial prayers. Sometimes you see a prayer and it gets answered right away. It's something you can see, you can mark the time when it happens, the time when you prayed. But there's another kind of prayer that's memorial prayers. And the way he describes this, which is, I just find it really clear, is it's like a layaway. When you pray, you're walking into heaven's layaway and you're making a payment on the answer to your prayer. Every time you go into your prayer room and you ask God about that, you're making another little payment. You don't know the full price. You don't know how many payments it's going to take. But one of those days, if you keep making payments, it's going to be paid off. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want to give up praying, because what if that was the last payment that it was needed to pay that thing off? What if you gave up just one time, one prayer away from the answer? And Psalm 56 and 8, if you could bring that up on the screen, says, Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears in thy bottle, are they not in thy book? And I don't know if this means one big bottle with all the tears mixed together, or if there's, you know, each person has their own, God has a bottle for each person. I don't know that much about it. But this is the way I picture it. Whether this is accurate or not, I don't know. But I picture a bunch of shelves up in heaven somewhere, and there's a bottle. And maybe they have names written on them, or maybe they're prayer requests. But there's bottles sitting there. And every time the saint of God prays, their tears are added to that bottle. And, you know, it starts out, there's not very much, and it keeps growing and growing every single time they pray and weep before God for that need. But the cool thing is, one day, that bottle's going to overflow, because there's only so much room in it before it can't contain anymore. And so one day, there, you know, there's a few more drops going to be added in there, and it's going to start kind of running on the floor, and an angel's going to see it, and they're going to say, that bottle's leaking. So they're going to have to run to God and say, God, you've got to do something about that prayer because that bottle's not holding anymore. It's starting to overflow and drip down onto the floor. And so God's going to have, that'll get his attention and he'll have to do something about it. Amen. The same way as when, you know, you finish off paying something at the layaway, that, that object is now yours. And so you don't want to give up just before it, it's paid off in full. And Hannah was desperate for something for God, and she was determined that she wasn't going to give up one time away from the answer to her prayer, but yet she kept on going and kept on praying, kept on going before God's throne with her request. And Hannah's deepest desire was for a child. And the church also has a really deep desire, and they are desperate for something as well, and it is for spiritual children. In the Bible, there's a comparison between the church and a mother, because this is a church that you can't join. You can't sign a membership card and become part of it. You have to be born into it. John 3 and 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And we know that, that talking about being born of the water, being born of baptism in Jesus' name, and born in the Holy Ghost, and that's the way that a person becomes a member of this church as a whole, of God's true church. And so if there's children being born, 
then there has to be a mother and a father. It makes sense. Amen. We know that the father is God, that when we are born, it's born into Jesus' family, and the, mother, the church in the Bible is portrayed as the mother. And to be born again, you, it takes both. It takes both. So the desire of the church, the deepest desire of the church, is also God's deepest desire, and that's to see souls being born into the kingdom of God. And if the church isn't seeing that happen, they're never going to be satisfied, and it's never going to be happy. Amen. Just like Hannah cried out in desperation for a, church, for a child, the church should be crying out for souls and people that are lost. We are meant to have spiritual children. We are meant to see souls saved. And if that isn't happening, there's, it's a desperate situation. It's, it's important. We all know, we can all count so many people that we know, whether they're family, they're friends, loved ones of some kind, or just people that we meet every single day that don't know Jesus, that don't know how, the way to heaven, that don't know how to be born again. And like Hannah, we got to get desperate about that and get on our face before God, pouring out our soul to him, saying, God, there's this person and they don't know you, and standing in the gap between them and God and interceding for them. Interceding a word just means standing in the gap, standing between God and someone who doesn't know them and just pulling them closer together, praying when they don't know how to pray or they don't even know that they need to pray, praying in their place. And before a woman has a child, there's some preparations uh, there's something in nature that's called a nesting instinct, and if you've seen dogs or cats that are having pups or kittens, before they actually have the litter, sometimes you'll see them dragging blankets or dog or stuffed animals for the dogs, or or kittens will f or cats will rather will find soft animals, and they kind of take them and steal them away in some hidden place, and um, you wouldn't see them doing it too many too many other times, but it's just before they they're having there are kittens or whatever, and it's called a nesting instinct. It's this instinct to have a shelter for the baby to come into. And um, the internet says, I don't know if it's true, but even human mothers, before the baby comes, has this instinct to clean and organize more than usual. I wouldn't know if that's true or not, but that's what the internet says. Either way, there's baby showers to be had, there's clothes to be sewn, there's nursery to be decorated, etc. There's preparations that happen before the baby comes. And before the birth of a, of a person into the kingdom of God, there's preparation that goes on within the church. And the environment has to be prepared, and the atmosphere has to be right for someone to be born. And that atmosphere is created through worship, through prayer, through living holy, and just loving truth. We create an atmosphere when we live like we know we ought to, and as the Bible says, and we worship and pray, that atmosphere is created where spiritual children can be born, where souls that need Jesus can come into the kingdom of God. And so that places a responsibility on our shoulders. We have to pray, pray for our families, pray for our friends, pray for our communities, because we might be their only hope. They have to reach Jesus somehow. It's the only hope for eternity, but we might be the only link that they have to God. So we have to pray like never before. Isaiah 66 and 8 says, For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. We have to be willing to travail in prayer. That's a desperate prayer. A prayer that, you know, it's not quick and easy, but it's a prayer that says, God, no matter what it takes, I want to see this soul saved. I want to see these people come to you. And that kind of prayer births things in the spirit. So that's the church's greatest desire, is to see souls saved, and it should be ours as individuals as well. And finally, let's just look at this on a more personal level. We all have needs. Some of them are small, some of them are big, and they're, some of them are for ourselves, and sometimes for others, for a family member or whatever, but we all have needs. And sometimes there's things we've prayed about countless, countless times. We've prayed maybe for days, maybe for months, and maybe for years, and absolutely nothing has happened. We've said, God, where are you? Why don't you hear my prayer, and why aren't you answering? But all it is is a case of what Hannah went through. She probably got discouraged, too. 
She probably said, I don't understand, God, why you won't hear me. I don't understand why you're answering me. Maybe she doubted that God would even ever hear her. But still, every year, year after year, she went into the temple and she said, God, I'm pouring out my soul to you. I'm pouring it out to you. This is my desire. Yes. She was willing to serve. She was willing to carry out her end of the bargain. She wasn't concerned with the opinions of others. And it, she didn't care if anyone else heard her because she was desperate. And desperation will always get the attention of God. When Jacob wrestled with, with uh, the angel of God, he said, or the angel said, God said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And we can do the same thing and say, God, I'm not letting go. I'm not stopping praying. I'm not going to let this rest until I see the answer. I'm just, and he told a parable actually in the New Testament about the unjust judge and a lady uh, seeking justice from her adversary kept coming to this judge and the judge kept sending her away, go away. And she kept begging him. And finally he just gave in just so she would get off his back. And the Bible says how much more would God delight to answer the prayers of his, of his children? It's, he's like a father to us. He, would, he loves to answer our prayer. But yet, when that lady kept pestering the unjust judge, finally he gave in. So how much more is God going to answer our prayer when we're persistent about it? God always responds to a desperate prayer. There was also blind men in the New Testament that cried out saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd said, shh, shh. you know, it's, it's Jesus. You need to just be quiet and listen. And yet he was desperate for the answer to prayer, and he kept crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus turned and said, where's that man? I want him brought to me. And he said, what do you need? And he said, I, well, that you would, I, I wish you would open my eyes. And that's, Jesus did it. He responded to the desperation and the need. Psalms 88 and 1 says, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee and incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth near unto the grave. And verse 9 says, Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee, and I have stretched out my hand unto thee. And Irma, if you would come back to the music. I don't know, maybe I'm only talking to one person. Maybe this, this, maybe this is something you can use down the road. I don't know. But perhaps there's someone here that that's what they feel like. Like they've cried unto God so many times and they've prayed for something and it seems like heaven's just silent and that they can't see their answer. But remember Hannah, how she went back year after year with the same need. Remember that bottle in heaven that's, you know, the tears are adding up in and one day it's going to overflow. You just keep making that payment. Don't give up because it might be the last one. And so if we could, if, as she starts playing and singing, as we could come, if we could stay, all stand. And let's come to this altar because today, you don't know, it could be the last payment. It could be the last one that makes that bottle overflow. That's right. We don't know, so keep making payments. Maybe today is your day. If it's not, keep on praying. If it is, this bottle's got to overflow sometime. Sometime your pa that prayer is going to be paid off. So let's just come and talk to Jesus, pour, like Hannah did, just pour out your soul before God. <laughs>